Kevin Wilson here alongside the Jake Delhomme, UL football legend, Jake Delhomme. How's that? How's that sound to you? It sounds great. I kind of blush. I get embarrassed by it. Uh, I'm just proud the way you said my last name. I mean, you said it. Look, Jake Delhomme. Del- hey, look, I've been pronounced. It's been pronounced so many Delom. ways. John Fox, who was my head coach in Carolina. Mm-hmm. He still can't say it to this day, you know. <laughs> the home, the, I mean, he just he still would, he would butcher it all the time. Hey, Jake, exactly, that's, that's you exactly. <laughs> How are you, man? I'm doing good, very well. All right, good, good to see you. Um, you want to tell the people the uh, little conversation we had about your uh, your attire today? Yeah, I. Uh, you know, you always want to be presentable right. when you come and do something, and uh, you know, I didn't know how much we were going to show, and I had my my UL polo shirt, and mm-hmm. um, I had on some pants. Um, had a little bit of mud on them. A little uh, bit. Is well, that what we're going with a little bit. It, it might it, maybe it looked like I was uh, rolling around in the mud, but there I did go. come from the barn. We mm-hmm. have race horses, my family, so I did come from the barn, and uh, I brought an extra pair. I just wasn't sure. And you said, "Look, no problem if you have a little mud on them." Then I looked at them and I said, "Well, let me change." And uh, I showed you the proof, and it wasn't a little mud. Yeah, it was a good call by you because uh, I <laughs> when you when you brought up the question, I'm like, eh, "It's probably just a little bit of mud." This guy wouldn't come in just fully loaded. I get to the truck and see these. <laughs> Black pants that are brown. Right. Fully loaded. That's a great way. To, it's fully loaded with mud. You're exactly <laughs> There's right. There's a great audible at the line. By, That's uh, a, I've, I've known to make a few. Um, some good, some bad. I think this was, uh, this one was a good one. So you were in the barn. Yes. I know you got a love for horses. Right. Where'd that start? Uh... From birth, I am um, a third generation, uh, thoroughbred racehorse owner, breeder, um, and started with my grandfather. Uh, from here, horse racing has a huge history in South Louisiana. If you go throughout the history, many jockeys have come from this area that have won the Kentucky Derby um, multiple times. And so, horse racing was a very big event Um and still is, not quite as much as it was in the past. It was a huge family type of event. Families go to the racetrack, and it was um, my grandfather was involved in it. Um, and he was had a lot of property, uh, farmed cattle, you know, and things like that, and uh, had the racehorses. My dad kind of followed in his footsteps. Dad did have a—he worked for the state. He retired with the state after 35, 36 years, but always trained horses. And we just follow along. That's what we did. Uh, you know, we went to school, played sports, then we shoveled poop. I mean, it's, <laughs> I, I don't know any other way, Every way to put it. That's that's what we did, and that's what we loved. And there's something about I know the barn for me, um, the racing aspect of, uh, of the horse racing. It feels a competitive void that I'm, I think I miss from playing football. I think everybody misses once they're playing something they've been doing for a while. Um, but also, to me, it recreates the locker room all over again. I, I, if there's one thing I miss about pro football, obviously people say the checks. Of course you miss that. But you miss the locker room. You miss the camaraderie in the locker room. Um, that's the barn. The, you the, well, you're in a barn with the horses and so many other guys in there. That, you know, you're working. Okay, okay. You, we, we share a barn with a few other trainers and their crew, and it's like the locker room. Yeah. It really is the banter that goes back and forth, and certain things that are done and said in there. You probably can't do it in too many office buildings that is fair. Uh, in corporate America, <laughs> I should you. say. So that's, I mean, that's what I enjoy about it. Just and um, and when you run against somebody, you go, you you run your horse and. It's made the best man win, you know. And if you did a good job, I don't want to say you don't boast. You 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 win with class, okay. you know. And then when you act lose, like you've been there before, act like you've been there when you lose, and <laughs> yeah. somebody beats you, you know, you go back to work harder. Mm. What can you do to get better? That's 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 what I like about it. The whole sports kind of uh, or the football aspect of it to me it relates to that. What's well, harder getting a a horse ready or getting ready for a game against a Tampa two defense and well, Derek Brooks and Rondé Barber as a player. I knew what I needed to get done, uh, and I could say, tell a coach something, hey, okay, now, I'm a little confused about this, how exactly. Those horses don't talk, man, and you don't know. You can get them ready, <laughs> mm-hmm. but they don't talk back to let you know, hey, I'm not feeling too good today, or I don't know how how in shape I really am. So, uh, so you're saying on tape that racing horses it, is significantly more difficult than the national well, think, football. Okay, think about it. If – you look at horse trainers. Take them, the best horse trainers in the world. They win about 27 to 30% of the time. Hmm. If Bill Belichick won 27 to 30% of his games, he's not coaching. He's fired. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it's a little difficult. Sorry to disrespect you, Jake. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, seventh grade. All right. Um, you're racing horses, throwing a football around, and you meet a young lady named Carrie. Yes. What is it that caught your eye there? Well, one, she's beautiful. Okay. You have to say that. Right? I, well, I, I, and, and I mean it. And two, um, you know, we just, we were friends, mm. you know, uh, she was athletic and, and just had, full of life. You know, she's kind of a, um, she's a magnet. People are drawn to her. Mm. And, um, obviously I was, and, uh, I was probably, she was all of five, one full grown <laughs> back then. And mm -hmm. I was five, three at the time, uh, obviously not even remotely close to being full grown. And we just, we became friends and next thing you know, here we are. We're both 43. We're married and got a couple of kids. Been together this whole time. Yeah, this whole time. You know, uh, all through high school, all through college here at USL. Mm -hmm. um, and it go, shows our age a little bit. Um, you know, she's a graduate of here. And then, uh, lucky enough, um, I had that constant in, my, constant in my life when I played in the NFL. Uh, because it's, it's a very demanding job, a uh, very difficult job. Obviously, the good times are, are very good, but the times whenever uh, you don't play well, or if I throw a bunch of, bunch of inter interceptions and Tough. things like that, you know, it's difficult, you know, and uh, to have a steady, constant home life, it, tr it truly helped. If she says in the seventh, eighth grade, I hate horses. Can you just leave the horses alone? What happens? Well, I'm going to say you have to give them a chance, first of <laughs> give all. Them a chance, you okay. know, give them a chance. But, uh, you know, I, look, the horses are like a drug, man. It gets in your system. There's just something about it. And uh, But I'm glad she never did that. <laughs> awesome. Let's take it back to high school for you. Playing some football. You're all state. Right. That's a defensive back. <laughs> How do you end up at USL at the time as a quarterback? Well, look. I was at Turlings Catholic, and now they're a 4A football team, mm -hmm. size-wise. We were single-A back then. We had 25 guys on the team. You were Iron Man. Including freshmen. Yeah. I punted, I kicked, I played free safety and quarterback. But that we all did. Every one of us on the team, had you had to go both ways. And so, uh, did pretty well playing quarterback, threw up some pretty nice numbers and things like that. But there was another quarterback in single-A at the time named Josh Booty, who was a year younger than me. But I think when he finished playing in high school, he had the national record for the most yards thrown, touchdowns, and everything. Okay, he and did it all. Yeah, he was yeah. the kind of he was the USA Today, I think, Player of the Year and all that, and signed with LSU. So maybe I was the afterthought. But I did play defense, and I, th I had a, I had a bunch of interceptions, um, not throwing, catching the interceptions. <laughs> yeah, you got to clear that up. Yeah, when I was in uh, <laughs> high school, and I had a good amount in the playoffs, and so. Okay. Uh, oh, so you shined at DB. And it, I played free safety, and uh, I just would watch the quarterback's eyes and right. wherever they took wherever they you went. knew what they were looking for. yeah and I, and I went and i could take advantage of those poor, poor well, high listen, school quarterback. if a quarterback and i tell this to receivers all the time the quarterbacks have the best hands on the team and they look at me like i'm crazy i said we have to play catch with somebody growing up so we have mm. to learn how to catch the ball mm. quarterbacks have the best hands on the team right, right. so i mean it, it's a proven fact and in in the shotgun how often are you actually watching the ball you're really your hands? you're really not i mean you're right. you're trying to you're trying to watch everything from the play clock, shift of the shifting of the defense, the movement, a pre-snap read, a post-snap read, and you just hope your center's fairly accurate in this in this vicinity. <laughs> so, I uh, shotgun, and obviously everybody's going to the shotgun now. Uh, I still wish people would put their hands in the center. The ball gets in your hand immediately. Jim Harbaugh is probably the last uh, coach on earth who's doing that every every play now, and he's very successful. That's a fact. Um, I'll stay DB, but somehow. USL says we want you, but to play quarterback. Were other schools recruiting you for quarterback? Or? Yeah, I got offered by everyone in, in the state besides LSU to play quarterback. Uh, to play quarterback, okay. yeah, okay. To, to play quarterback. And um, I got, I was recruited by Duke, by Navy, by West Point, and uh, in those places. But uh, I, I really and truly thought I was going to Tulane. Uh, school academics obviously were very important to me, and I, I was going to go play at Tulane. And I'll be very honest, I decided to stay here and, and play for a coach. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the coach was Louis Cook. He was the offensive coordinator. Um, he's a legend in Louisiana high school football. He's a coach at Notre Dame High School, but he's an absolute legend. And um, I decided uh, I wanted to play for him. And uh, best decision I ever made. So the recruiting process really absolutely meant, meant a ton to you. You know, and 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 nowadays, I'm so glad I'm not getting rec recruited nowadays with all the Twitter and 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 all these things that that go out now. It was so different back then. Hmm. Um, this is back in '91, '92. 
Uh, so you had to put forth a true effort. Well, to really it, land. there's no internet and yeah, things yeah. of that nature, but a phone call. And I used to, I used to relish the phone call. He'd always call every Thursday night, Coach mm-hmm. Cook, and I used to relish getting that phone call because. He didn't bash other schools. He didn't talk about – we just talked. It was refreshing to you. It was a friend. Mm. And he, we talked about who y'all have tomorrow night. What do they do on defense? How y'all, y'all healthy? How y'all, I, and it was just – I couldn't wait to talk to him. Mm. And you talk to these other coaches, and they just want to bash another school. You're not telling me anything. You know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need to hear that. Mm. I don't do with negative noise. I've, I've never dealt with – well with negative noise. I don't like it. I don't want it in my life. And that was just something. We had a connection, um, and it just it worked. You get on campus your first day, and uh, you're kind of thrusted right into the limelight right. for, for the football program. What was that like? You know, I had an idea. The, the speculation was I was, I was going to redshirt. I was, you know, 6'2", about 170 pounds, 175, real thin, to mm-hmm. say the least. Um, thought I was going to red shirt. And, um, but all summer long, guys didn't come to summer school at that time. A freshman didn't enroll. It just That wasn't the thing to do back then. But living here, I worked out with the team all summer. Mm. I, would, I would work out with them. So I, had, I got to know the guys well. So when we reported to camp, there wasn't a learning curve for me of learning players and being nervous, where to go, what to do. I had already done that that whole summer. And we had thrown during the summer. So I think that helped me a great deal. I, I didn't have that worry. And um, and Coach Cook would kind of throw me in there. I'd get some plays, get some reps, and I had an idea that listen, I think I might in my mind, I, uh-huh. man, there's I a could, chance I could play. I, could, yeah. I think I can hang with these guys, even though the pads were bigger than you. Man, there's no doubt they were bigger <laughs> than me. And um, and going into the first game of the season, I was listed as the fourth guy on the depth chart. But I had an idea. If things didn't go well. Be ready. Mm. You know, Coach Cook, he had warned me a few weeks prior, and they put me in one of the scrimmages a couple of weeks before the first game with the twos, and things went out, went pretty well that day. And I I knew, he goes, hey, you, be ready. You mm. better be ready to play. And he didn't need to tell me twice. You were already ready. Yeah. Uh, first start, you're looking around, and now the pressure's on you. There's right. no more coaching from the sideline. Right. No more thoughts of, hey, I could do that better. Why didn't he do this? It's on you every single snap. Yeah. What's that feeling? Uh, I love it. Mm. I mean, there's nothing. To me, I I relish that. I really and truly do. I got thrown in at halftime of the first game. We were losing pretty good. The other quarterback struggled. So I was able to get really probably most of the jitters out the way. And uh, did okay in the third and fourth quarter. Was able to throw a touchdown pass or two. So I got that out of the way. So that was well, a real humble brag you just dropped. Well, I don't, I don't just, want to just slide we, through we, that. I, you know, I was able to get it out of the threw way. A, a touchdown or two. But it just, I, you know, it broke the ice. Yeah. Broke yeah. the ice. Mm-hmm. Was able to make plays. And, but not only that, the team believed in me. They thought I gave them hope. Mm. And I'll be very honest with you. Look, quarterbacks get a lot of praise and they get a lot of – you know, a lot of the blame, like they, they deserve it. Because if you don't have one, you see it in the NFL every week. You don't have a quarterback, you, you can't win. I mean, mm-hmm. you can't win. That's you, a fact. You, you cannot win. Right. And so those guys started to believe in me. And, you know, that's a lot of responsibility, but that's something I, I always relished. I, I, I loved it. I relished it. And I wanted to do well for them. And so it started from there. What does Brandon Stokely come into this equation? Brandon, obviously, his dad, Nelson, was our head coach. And Brandon, um, when I was a true freshman, he was a senior in high school. And he it was the only year of high school football that he played because he was so tiny. He mm-hmm. played as a freshman at Como High School, so small. I think he might have gotten hurt. But when I tell you he was tiny, yeah. he... he He's not the biggest guy now. No, he's he's bigger than you think, but like he hadn't matured yet. So he plays as a senior, and the body's just starting to grow, and he led the state in receptions in 5A football, and so he gets signed by UL. Well, everyone thinks that he's signed because his dad's the head coach. So he comes out to throw with us that summer, June, going into the season. And the first day he's out there, he's better than anything we have. His feet are bigger than, him, bigger than his body still. You, you know, he's in the baby giraffe stage. But... He just runs better routes. His hands are effortless. Um, and Coach Stoke, they redshirted him. And so I only got to play two years with him mm-hmm. instead of three. Yeah. So he redshirts uh, because he dresses for the first six games. And then after that, when nobody had really gotten hurt, though they needed to pull the redshirt off, he went and played basketball for the basketball team here. So he was a pretty freaky athlete. And then we had two years together. And uh, 
He was good, man. He was good. He was he was a, he was so competitive. That's that's what made him. That's what sent him over the top. He wanted to. He hated losing probably as much as I did, and oh, I didn't like to lose. And I think that helped. I think that helped. Like to have those type of players around you. Well, I think it helped our offense. I, you know, I demanded a, a great deal out of him. He demanded a lot out of me. We took it out on each other on the field. But never off the field. When we walked off the practice field, I mean, it is what it is. And so, you know, by us two demanding that much, it made everybody else kind of raise up their game, I think. Awesome. You get to your senior year. Right. You end your career as the, you know, passing, the school's passing leader in yards mm-hmm. and touchdowns. Any murmurs about you getting drafted? What was the conversation? No. Um, you know, scouts would come and go and things like that during the course of the season. Um, we had a fullback, Kenyon Cotton, who wasn't drafted but ended up playing a year or two in the NFL. Uh, Donald Richard, a receiver, also Donald was on the practice squad for a year. So scouts would come and go. And maybe, I don't know if I was an afterthought or whatnot, but I was just, yeah, they kind of liked me. And really, I only worked out for two teams uh, at the end of the season, Miami and, gosh, someone else. I don't even truly remember. Mm, mm. Um, and then I, I went to a um, a local workout with the Saints. Um, fused the fake address, used my aunt and uncle's address in, in New Orleans in Metairie. And so I was able to go there and had a pretty good workout that day. And I was the only quarterback, which helped out. So a ton of throws, and it went pretty well. But going and into the draft, you... I knew I wasn't going to get drafted. Okay. I'm just hoping for a free agent type of deal. Okay. So your and mind this was, was already there. Yeah, yeah. Because I wasn't invited to the combine and things of that nature. So I had a decent idea that it's probably not going to be a draft mm-hmm. Uh draft pick of me that day and then um draft comes and goes uh, no one calls no free agent i bought her to head to canada to go play up in the cfl good football up there you know i just i wanted to play wanted a chance Mm -hmm. and then i get a phone call uh from one of the saints um personnel guys uh they were going to release jim everett and wanted to see if i wanted to come in you know rookie free agent tryout for uh, that camp well absolutely i went they signed me after that weekend and i was the fourth arm going into camp i knew that yeah but um the opportunities in practice and things like that i did some decent things and they felt enough to bring me back at some point on the practice squad so you're you're brought in by new orleans and then they ship you to Another part of the world. Correct. And uh, was it Amsterdam you Amsterdam, started with? Amsterdam, yeah. And you played with a uh, special player that Very. we would find out later. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and Kurt Warner. What was the experience? NFL Europe. I, I, there's some kids who are going to be listening to this that have no idea what NFL Europe is. NFL was. Europe was the minor leagues of the NFL. It was something the NFL started, and it was six teams. Um, and the NFL, the teams themselves would allocate players and send them over. So it wasn't guys out of college. Those guys had to go to training camp. It was the ones a year removed from college or older um older guys that have gotten released. So the Saints allocated me to Amsterdam, the Amsterdam Admirals. And there's only 35 guys on the, on the team, so it's not like it's a, a, a big roster. You play 10 games. Mm-hmm. Training camp is in the States, and it's all in one location. So a lot of those scouts and, and, and teams can go there and watch their players, and they send quarterbacks, kickers they might kind of like down the line, offensive linemen, uh, a lot of guys that um, – Smaller schools, receiver-wise, I think those were the guys they truly developed this league right, for. Right. Because if you look at the offensive linemen that came from NFL Europe and the and the kickers and the receivers and quarterbacks, that was kind of it. So I go to Amsterdam, go to training camp, two um, two quarterbacks in camp. That's it. Every other team had three and four, only had two. Myself and this arena league quarterback. Right. So I remember calling back home after each scrimmage and or whatnot and talking to my wife, who was my girlfriend, uh, and talking to my parents at the same time, and how's the other guy doing? Because you want to know about competition. And I could say, well, he's kind of accurate. And he's kind of accurate. He's a good guy, yeah. and he's, you know, he's not Quick bad. on the trigger, that Iowa Barnstorm was Exactly. Iowa Bar- he was yeah. the uh, MVP of the Arena League in yeah. St. Louis that allocated him. I was 21 at the time. He was 26. Um, and he had played a lot more football hmm. at that, that time. And he, Kurt, even to this day, Kurt Warner will always say the Arena League helped prepare him to get the ball out of his hands quick. And that's why it worked out so well for him in St. Louis, the greatest show on turf, because they would just 
you know, it was full speed. Yep. And um, and so backed him up that year. We went seven and three, backed him up. Um, then I got sent back to NFL Europe the following year to Frankfurt with my same offensive coordinator that I had in Amsterdam. He left and went to another team, so nice. I went with him, and that worked out. Uh, played a lot more. We were able to win the league. Um, now, while you're over in Europe, uh-huh. you know, what's that conversation like with Carrie? Well, she would come visit for like a week or so, but I mean, you're there 10 weeks. It's not like you're there a great deal. Um, you're not getting paid a ton of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, everybody, even though the games were televised. Even though the games are televised, mm-hmm. everybody is, uh, it's base pay. Everybody's getting the same amount of money. Um, but you got to play and you mm-hmm. got to get film and, and things like that. And, and, uh, you know, I came back to the Saints and went to camp, and camp went all right and got released again. And then Kurt Warner is starting for the St. Louis Rams, and he's dominating the league. Dominating. And you're saying to yourself, man, I, I, we weren't that far off. Because between him and I, that year, the, we found out who was starting for Amsterdam about – an hour and a half before the first game. They didn't oh, tell us. Of course. We didn't know. Right. And the, it's a great conversation because the coach was Al Luganbill, was our coach. He was the coach at San Diego State when they had Marshall Falk. And he cared about defense, special teams, and defense. And he thought offense was just in the way. That was his mindset. And so it wasn't healthy for a quarterback, to say the <laughs> least. He sat Kurt and I down, and he said, listen, both of you are going to play. Uh, Kurt, we're going to start you today. Jake, you're going to play. I just want both of you to remember one thing. You don't have to win the game for us. Neither one of you lose it. So thanks, Coach. Thanks for all the uh, – so needless to say, uh, Kurt had a lot of success with, uh, with, a, with a coach with that type of mindset. <laughs> awesome. So Kurt, Kurt was pretty good. World Bowl, yeah. 99. Right. You, you briefly just brushed it off, but, I mean, you won the Super Bowl in NFL Hey, Europe. we won the – we were World Bowl champs. Yeah. We played the Barcelona Dragons, led by Lawrence Phillips. Mm. And he was a talented player. Yeah, and you see why he was drafted so so early. And he was really good, and uh, we were able to neutralize him. And we had a good day that day. We uh, had a good day that we, day. <laughs> we, 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 uh, yeah, we, we played well. We played well. The reason we were good in Bar- in, in, in Frankfurt is because, and I tell this people all the time, chemistry as a team is so important. Everybody knew we were sending NFL Europe because we weren't good enough for the NFL, and we accepted it. Mm. That's who we were, and we, we, were, we accepted it, and we, made the, we, be, we said we're going to be the best players we can be. And sure enough, off that team, we had a few of us that go on and play for a while in the NFL off that team. You're back in the NFL. The Saints bring you back in. You get to the uh, the following season, and we get toward the end of the year. Right. And there's an opportunity for Jake. Right. Your first start comes. It's against the Dallas Cowboys. Correct. So across the field, it's Troy Aikman. Right. There's Emmitt Smith. Right. What in the world is going through your mind there? Well, we were terrible with the Saints. We were 2-12. and 12. We were awful. Uh, they had played Billy Joe Hobart. Billy Joe Tolliver, Danny Werfel, <laughs> uh, and I guess I was left. I was that, I was the one left. Jake, it's on you. Yeah. So uh, short week. We had just played Baltimore the week prior. They absolutely destroyed us. That was the year Baltimore won it all. Their defense was unbelievable. They hurt Billy Joe Tolliver, or Billy was Billy was hurt. That's how I was back on the team. And so Ditka was going to give me the, the start. Mike Ditka. We played on the Friday, Christmas Eve. So short rest, only game in town. Um, you know, we were a terrible team when playing the Dallas Cowboys. Chan Gailey was their coach, and they were fighting for their playoff lives. And um, we came out and we played well. You know, the team, I think the team responded. Uh, we started out fast. I was able to get an early touchdown pass in the game and kind of gave them some life. I could run around a little bit mm-hmm. back then, and uh, we just, the Superdome. Came a rockin' and we beat them. It was a lot of fun, man. It was um, still to this day, and obviously because I live here in Louisiana, people still bring up that game and talk about that game. But it was a lot of fun. You beat the mighty Cowboys. We man. beat the Cowboys. Doesn't matter how down they yeah, were. Yeah, you know, Deion Sanders was the one of the corners on, on that team. Playing and the receiver then too. Yeah, yeah, Darren Woodson, who I watch on NFL uh, on, on ESPN now. Um, you know, and it's funny. My first pass of the game was an interception. Mm. It was a, a easy pass to the right. It was just a two-man concept. 
Keith Poole is wide open, and I throw it. The defensive end, Kavika Pittman, who ended up being a teammate of mine, jumps up, bats it down, and the ball ricochets the other side of the field, and Woodson picks it off. Your boy, like, Darren Woodson. That's you? great. That's great. That's the way to Here's start. Here's my career. But, you know, hey, it, uh, I started with the uh, uh, interception, and I got lucky to finish it with a touchdown pass. Your first NFL touchdown pass. What was that feeling like? It was great. It was to uh, Eddie Kinnison on a go route. And, um, you know, I was able to hit Very him. underrated receiver. Eddie very Kinnison. underrated, yeah. very fast, and a good guy. Yeah. You know, um, Washington, local guy out of Washington, Marion Lake Charles, certainly an LSU guy, um, but a talented player who ended up carving out a very nice career for himself, but hit Eddie in stride and he just ran away from him. So, uh, yeah, I, rem- I remember that well. Post game, you talked to Kerry about that moment? Uh, I think there wasn't words to be said. I think everybody was just on cloud nine. Just I mean, just, <laughs> we don't even we don't we don't know what to do. You yeah, know, right. oh wait, I have to do an interview after the game. You know, right, what I mean, it's just right. one of those deals that is just you know, it was it was crazy. Let's fast forward to two thousand and three. Right, you're in Carolina. Mm-hmm. Still backup. Right, um, you're behind Rodney Pete. Correct at the time, and you get another shot this time. It's in game one against the Jaguars. Right. You take over, you're down big. You're just filling time. But you make some magic happen. Talk about that game. Yeah. um, Go to Carolina. Like you said, Rodney was the starter. Now, in Rodney's defense, Rodney was 36 at the time. He didn't want to. He didn't want to be the starter. I mean, Rodney had played. Mm. Rodney went the year prior in '02 to back up Chris Winkie because Winkie was the guy. And for one thing or another, Winkie might have had an injury. Rodney had to play, and he just played a little bit better than Chris. Mm. And uh, Rodney won seven games. They went seven and nine. That was a team that was one and fifteen the year prior. So he inherited it. And so go to camp. Camp went pretty good for me. I finished it off really well and knew there was an opportunity. Hey, just be same thing as in college. Be ready. Mm-hmm. You're the backup, but be ready. And we were struggling offensively against Jacksonville. We were down 17 nothing at half, and we, we were having trouble moving the ball. And I got the call to go in. And it um, we made some plays early on, and the game went down to the end, and we were able to beat them on a touchdown pass on a fourth down play, and it started from there. And I, I will say this. The next day after that game, I'm in the weight room working out, and you know, I, I I cut up with guys. I like to have fun. I mean, I and uh, my center Jeff Mitchell, at the time, uh, he came up to me and he goes, "Hey, listen, you quit acting like you're not all excited, okay?" <laughs> and that's just typical Jeff right, right. because you know you are. He said, "You know, you're all happy with yourself." He said, "There's only one person happier than you, and that's Rodney Pete." So he didn't have to play <laughs> he anymore. He did not want to be in that and lineup. He could just be in the <laughs> sideline with his towel, yep. and uh, and it was it, it was truly great because Rodney was one very intelligent, um, but just a great leader, and just the way he accepted that role and embraced it. He he was a captain, and he was looked looked upon as a captain. A captain, and he was a backup quarterback. And we had him for two years, and the only reason we didn't have him for a third year because he. Um, he got a job with Best Damn Sports Show, mm. and he was making similar money as being a backup quarterback. Well, and it was I mean, right down the road. I don't have from to the, get hit. I don't have to practice. Right down the camp. road from his house in Beverly Hills. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, he yeah. he hung it up. But um, yeah, it worked out. Two thousand three. That sparks a magical year for for Jake Delhomme and um, eight comeback victories right. for Jake. And you guys have a tremendous record. And now you're the starting quarterback. <laughs> In the playoffs. Yeah. Okay. Your playoff experience was in NFL Europe. This is a different level, and you're playing some major names. Right. Cowboys, Rams, and Donovan McNabb and the Philadelphia Correct. Eagles Correct. Who was on fire. Right. Your first playoff experience. What? It was it was fantastic. We were playing Dallas in Carolina, and the Panthers hadn't been in the playoffs in years. And um, there was just something happening with our team. Everybody could sense it because any time a game was close, we went to overtime or fourth quarter. We made a play to win it. Um, we had uh, we. <sighs> 
we were a very close knit team, and a lot of it was due to two reasons. Mark Fields was our starting linebacker in training camp that year, and Sam Mills was our linebacker coach. They were both diagnosed with cancer within the same week. Mm-hmm. Um, Mark was a leukemia, but it, it looked like there was going to be um, a, the prognosis was good in, in, in curing his. Sam's, on the other hand, was terminal. Everybody knew it was terminal. And so all year long, you know, it was just we, we kind of fed off of those two. Here's Sam Mills, our linebacker coach, um, going through chemo radiation and not missing a practice, mm. coaching every week. And it was kind of just became something a little bit bigger. The keep pounding mantra the Panthers have embraced and they still use to this day. And that started from Sam when Sam talked to the team uh, in our playoff run night before one of the games. And he talked to us and and he said, the only thing I'm asking you, he said, every play, keep pounding. Every, you know, every quarter, keep pounding. And it just kind of, and it just took off. And it's still going, which is great to this, to this day. day. Yeah. But we were playing uh, Dallas that night, uh, 8 o'clock game. The city was a buzz. And we lost to Dallas about a month and a half earlier when we didn't play well. There's nothing like losing to somebody and knowing we didn't play well and right. we're going we're gonna to whip you behind. Mm-hmm. And we did. And we whipped there behind that game. Um, fun night, great night. Uh, and then we go to St. Louis, beat them in double overtime. Mark Bolger. Mark Bolger. Not Kurt, let's Not be clear. Not Kurt, but still <laughs> Tory uh Tory Holt, Isaac Bruce. Was Kurt wanna hurt? Oh. Kurt Yes, Curdy kind of went on that that dive where he had the broken pinky for a couple of a oh, few that's years. Right. Yeah. yeah, that lasted forever. Lasted forever. Yeah. It lasted when he went to the Giants, you know. <laughs> and then next thing you know, he revived himself in uh, Arizona. in Arizona. Uh, but yeah, we were able to beat them double overtime, and then we went to mighty Philadelphia, and they were loaded. We lost to them also in December of that year. Hmm. So we couldn't. We didn't play well. We couldn't wait to play them again. And uh, but I'll tell you how we won that game. We jumped on them seven nothing, and then Donovan McNabb got hurt. He broke a rib. Somebody mm-hmm. landed on him, and when I tell you, it was like that stadium became quiet Just as flat. a church mouse because yeah. they knew in Philly, in one Philly, of the most raucous crowd, Sunday in. night, yeah. cold, and. When he went down, and he tried to come back to play, right. and all we did, we had the lead, and we weren't giving it back. Right. And we were just going to run it, throw it, just dink and dunk, whatever, just don't let him back in the game. And so we beat him, and then we go to the Super Bowl, play against uh, you know that, that team up in, in the Northeast. <laughs> uh, Super Bowl Sunday. Right. Night before. Did you sleep? I slept. Fantastic the night before. Really, I always slept well the night before a game. There's only the one game I did not sleep well was the first time I played the Saints in 2003. Um, I think that was just a, more of an ego thing for me. You know, like you didn't oh, think you were I was, ready to play yeah, today. You, yeah, you didn't yeah. think I was good enough. Right. I'm gonna just wait till tomorrow. Right. And I didn't sleep well that night. I didn't like that. But I always slept well the night before the game. Look, the haze in the barn. My work's done. I know what I'm supposed to do. I just got to go do it. But that night we went out uh, about 45 minutes south of Houston to this older resort. And I wouldn't even call it a resort. Um, we didn't know where we were going before. No one knew. Only a couple of people knew. The coach and the GM. And Mm -hmm. uh, we drove out there, and it was just us. And that night, we had a little duplex we stayed in, or fourplex, I guess you could say, uh, a, a living room. And then the four rooms, and it was Ricky Pro, Rodney Pete, myself, and Chris Winkie. And I remember about 10 o'clock. I went to bed. I woke up. Pre-game meal was not till 10 the next morning. I woke up at like 9 o'clock the next morning. What? I mean, just sle- I don't know if because <laughs> there was no noise where we were at. And mm. everybody had breakfast that morning. We were laughing because everybody was like, man, did I sleep good last night for whatever so reason. Quiet. Yeah, it was just, it was peaceful. Wow. It was so, yeah, I, I did sleep the night before. Absolutely. So you're in your suit and you're walking into... The arena. What's that feeling? Like? I don't think you're walking. You're floating. Mm. The drive, about a 45 minute drive, and you know everybody has headphones on or whatever it may be, and it's just silence. You had the Walkman going. I don't know if I it was this. It was it a Discman? I'm not sure what it was at the time. <laughs> uh-huh. I wasn't really a big uh, earphone guy for a game. I was more just look out the window, go through the game plan in my head, just just look at surroundings. That's kind of how I was. Um, but yeah, it was just quiet. And when you walked in. 
it was just like you knew mm. that okay, this is this is this is the biggest thing we've ever experienced in our life. Were you intimidated at all? No, not intimidated. Because you're, pl- I tell this to people, you're playing so well. You've been playing well since September. Mm. So your confidence level is through the roof. And obviously, you've played well the last month because you're, you're in that game. Right. So we had, we, had come, we had won five or six in a row, obviously the three playoff games. But leading up to it, you're just your confidence levels through the roof. You start to hear murmurs of Tom Brady, Tom Brady. Tom Brady, he's just he just wins. Right, he just wins. Was there any pressure? Did you feel any pressure to? No, and honestly, Tom had just won one Super Bowl at the time. Mm-hmm. So, and what they a were fourteen and two record. They were in. known for their defense that year. People yeah. forget about that defense. They did not allow like any team to score over nineteen points. They didn't. The longest rush on them that year was like maybe twenty something yards. They didn't. Their defense was so talented. They were so ta- just big across the board, uh, secondary, just everything about them. And that's what they were known as for their defense and offensively. You know, they ran it with. Uh, Kevin Falk, uh, Antoine Smith, and, and that bunch. And, you know, their receivers, Troy Brown, um, drawing a blank on number 87 for them. Um, you know, I, I can't remember if Deion Branch was there just yet. Um, but, they, you know, Christian Fourier was the tight end. It, it, they were just – offensively, well, they were okay. Right. But defensively Willie is where McGinnis, they – Willie McGinnis, Ty Law. Oh, yeah. Willie McGinnis, <laughs> Ty Law, Rodney Harrison, Mike Vrabel, Ted Bruschi, Ted Washington. Was Lawyer Malloy there? Uh, lawyer was already gone to Buffalo. Okay. Uh, wherever you looked, you were like, "Oh my gosh, Richard Seymour." <laughs> they were stacked. They were so big. When we lined up for the first play of the game, I remember looking from left to right because they were in there three, four, and I'm like, "Oh my gosh, hmm. they're huge." And we couldn't do anything for about a quarter, quarter and a half. I mean, they just stalemated us in every aspect. That fourth quarter explosion, right? What was that like going back and forth? You know what? You're not thinking. At that time of the game, you're not thinking, and you're just playing. And the game's moving slow. And I know in front of my eyes, it's moving slow. Um, and you're just, you're just playing back and forth. Let's go. Just, get, just make sure we have the ball last. I think that's kind of your mindset. So the feeling of being in the Super Bowl for you, did it kind of just wear off after the first play? Or it, the... It, it, it was during the, during the motion on the first play. I remember, look, Beyonce, I think, sang the national anthem. Uh, Josh Groban's out there singing. Toby Keith was out there singing. So, I mean, it, it was just. It was a lot. It was a lot, you know, and you're just like, oh my gosh, all this, yeah. you know, and just like a haze. And then when we lined up, the, the field in Houston is on tracks. It was brought in on these pallets, these big tracks. And so you could feel the vibration sometimes on the field. And I remember, under, hands under center, I and I sent Musin Muhammad in motion, and I heard the. Thump, 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 thump of him coming across. And I remember I looked from left to right and like, all right, it's time to play. Mm-hmm. And next thing you know, the game's over. So by the time you get into that shootout in the fourth quarter, you're not even thinking. No, you're, you're just playing. You're just playing. Wow. You come up short in a game where you were not even expected to be that right. close. Right. Um, what, what do you feel like? You know, you uh, the losers of the Super Bowl, if people watch it close, they get roped off the field. There's yellow jackets, the security jackets, and yellow ropes. And literally, there's a rope that's going to be pulled across in front of your sideline, and they're trying to get you off the field as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And the confetti's coming down. And I remember just, I wanted to be on the other side of that rope. You know, you're just watching, and I watched them celebrate a little bit, just knowing we're going to get back. We're going to get back. We were so close. It just, we didn't have it last. Did you cry? No, I think I was too emotionally exhausted to cry and emotionally drained. You had I, nothing left. Huh? I had nothing left. Mm. You know, um, the end of a long season, just nothing left. Just more of a, I can't wait to get back here. I just can't wait. Well, I, it, it, just when can we get started on the off season? I think that was more the mindset. The next season, you go seven and nine. Right. What happened? We started out one and seven. And we we were a shell of ourselves. We four of our five offensive linemen for the Super Bowl were not there. Um, Steve Smith, who was our star receiver, um, he broke his ankle the third quarter of the first game. Mm-hmm. Stephen Davis played two games for us. Our Pro Bowl running back mm-hmm. gone. Deshaun Foster was our other running back. Week four gone. Dan Morgan barely played our All Pro linebacker. Chris Jenkins, our All Pro, and all these guys weren't Pro Bowlers. They were All Pro. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chris Jenkins done for the year. Week two or three with a shoulder. 
we were a shell of ourselves. Right. And our, our, our running back, our lead running back became Nick Goins. And he was our third down back, but he was a special teams guy. And he became, he almost rushed for a thousand yards. We had to retool our offense, started out one and seven and won six out of our last eight. And, uh, Really, almost made the playoffs. Right, right. And so we knew going into that following year, you know, with everybody coming back, when out of out of someone here, a piece of the puzzle here and there, we're gonna have a chance. Which turns into a great year for you, right? Tons of wins, yeah. But playoff success, yeah. We lost. We lost in a championship game yep. to Seattle. We lost a better team up mm-hmm. in Seattle, the loudest place I've ever experienced in my life. Louder than the dome. 10 times. And Mark Brunel was the quarterback of the Redskins that same year. They beat Tampa the first round. They go to Seattle mm-hmm. and they beat get, and they lose. One of my linemen on the team and Mark were very good friends. They had played together in Jacksonville. So Brunel calls my buddy, Todd Fordham is his name, and said, Hey, tell Jake this will be the loudest place he's ever played in in his life. Mm-hmm. And then Brunel goes on to say, Jake's going to say, no, it's not. I played in the Superdome. Tell him, trust me, it will be something like he's never experienced. Brunel was right. Mm. We could not call the play in the huddle. I would say it four times. You, you could not. It was deafening. And they were just better than us. <laughs> so, they doubled yeah. Steve, and we lost our – Deshaun broke his leg in yeah. the first quarter. Nick Goins, the next running back, gets concussed in the first quarter. We're down to a guy we signed in November as our running back. And we just they – they, they just beat us. So you're literally in the huddle just yelling. You couldn't even remotely call. It was it was so loud. And then come to find out that stadium was built by some engineer that – he builds uh, for orchestras and symphonies. Oh, so he siphoned all the audio. All the, and, and so it rolls up, and then it, it hits like the roof, and it, it comes back. It, it, it's unbelievable. It's a great call by Seattle. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and that was Matt Hasselbeck. Matt Sean Hasselbeck, Alexander. Sean Alexander, Lofa yeah. Tatupu, yeah. all that. They, they, they were loaded. They were loaded and they yeah. should have beat Pittsburgh. They, it, refs kind of hurt them that Super Bowl. They should have been Super Bowl champs. Let's fast forward to 2008. Right. Back in the playoffs after another strong year. And then you run into a familiar friend. Kurt and, uh, Warner. Kurt Warner with a healthy hand now. <laughs> we played them that year. 2008, we would go 12-4. and four. Um, don't, I don't know how good we truly were. We had a schedule that was very favorable. We played the Detroit Lions, who were terrible. Mm-hmm. Kansas City Chiefs were atrocious. Our division was down. I mean, we just... It, it, the schedule just worked in our favor, mm-hmm. and we played bad teams. And sure enough, we had we were very we were a very unhealthy team um, physically wise going into that game. But we played Arizona week eight. We beat them at home. We were five and three or six and two at the break. We got lucky to beat them. Every call went our way. Mm-hmm. Things you know, Kurt had a, a couple of turnovers inside the red area. Just one of those games that everything went our way, and we knew they were going to be difficult. And that game, I was atrocious that game. Our defense was atrocious. I think Larry Fitzgerald had like 177 receiving yards in the middle of the second quarter. And we're trying to play catch up. And they just demolished us. It was, what, wasn't a good night for old Jay. Did you at least get a hug from Kurt, your, your boy? Oh, from, yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. From NFL Europe? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> and the disappointing thing is that that was my birthday. I mean, I was on Yikes. January 10th on my birthday, and I played one, this. one other playoff game on my birthday, and that was when we beat St. Louis in double overtime. Gotcha. So, I mean, it was a – I could. so I, I've gone – I've had two really good birthdays, you know. Uh, I mean, one really good birthday and one really bad birthday, and well, they both resolved, so you, revolved around football. Well, so you delivered to Kurt back. Back in the day in St. Louis when he couldn't play. <laughs> exactly right. And he got your ill zone team. Exactly that's right. right. Exactly now right. Now I don't feel so bad. Um, <sighs> things start to go downward for you. Uh, injuries start catching up. I think you're putting it mildly. Yeah. You I was terrible. To, injuries start adding up? Injuries, but a lot of just things changed. I lost my quarterback coach. I had him my whole time in Carolina, and um, he, he got offered a big promotion in Denver to go be the offensive coordinator for Josh McDaniels up in Denver. And he had to leave. And we're still best of friends to this day. And we had a certain way we did things. Our offense ran a, a certain way, and they brought in somebody new. And, you know, tried to change a lot of the things we did. And that's I know it sounds like I'm making an excuse, but it just it wasn't a good fit trying to you know, put a square peg in a round hole and, you know, 
it just didn't work. It didn't work for myself. It really didn't work for Steve and I changing up some things. And I think that just kind of kept on compound. You know, like it would just compound how bad I would play and probably try too hard. And and I think physically, my arm was fine, but the rest of the body, I couldn't move like I wanted to. Didn't like what I saw on film, to be very honest. And um, so you're literally watching yourself. And I could tell. I 2008 that season, there was a f- few things that happened that I was like, oh man, I don't like the way that looks. The ball wasn't supposed to go there. I was aiming here, and it went here, and. You just keep your mouth shut, and you try to work a little bit harder, and you just say you're in the best shape of your life. Wow. You know, that's that's kind of what the NFL, you know. But internally. I knew. I knew I, could, I, knew I, wasn't, I wasn't what I was. You know, I, you just know. Panthers, your team, they let you go. Right. You're in Cleveland now. Yeah. Eric Mangini. Right. Was this Eric's first coaching year or second? It was his second year After in Cleveland, yes. Okay, it was yeah. his second year. What was it like being in Cleveland? You know what? Everybody says that. We enjoyed it. A Cleveland's strange, a great city. I, we, had strange, we lived in Westlake. You know, um, we loved it. Great neighbors. The schools. My yeah. kids loved it. We, we had a good time. The weather, look, it's not good. Jake, you're doing everything but talking about this football team. That, that, that's Cleveland the only is thing, a great city. That's the only thing we could talk about. This organization <laughs> was so dysfunctional. And I, I feel bad for Eric Mangini. I, if I would own a team, I, I'm not saying he'd be the first person I'd hire. But I would definitely consider giving this guy. This guy was so undermined. They brought Mike Holmgren came in. He was going to be, you know, he's getting paid eight, nine million dollars a year to be the GM, and they undermined everything Eric did. They went behind his back on everything. They didn't draft the type of three, four players that we needed. And Eric was trying to do it the right way, and they just undercut him completely. And it, but it was the organization from the top down. I mean, the owner. Um, he spent more time in England watching his soccer team. I mean, they mm-hmm. they didn't they truly didn't care. And I feel sorry for the Cleveland fans. That's a great fan base, yeah. a great passionate fan base. And I truly believe um, they're going to turn it around. I, I think they finally have a football man in charge, um, John Dorsey. Um, you know, but look, the football part. Wow. It was a uh, it was interesting, and I stayed hurt. I, I stayed in a walking boot majority of the year. I only started four games. We won two out of the four, so that's five hundred in Cleveland. Come I mean, that's on, legendary. Let him know, Jake. That's legendary stats. <laughs> let them know. But I, you know, what, there's one thing I remember: Ben Watson, the tight, tight end for the Saints. Great tight end, better person. We were going to play Miami. I played two games early in the year, got hurt, and this was in November or December. We're going down to Miami to play. We didn't have much talent on the team, be very honest, especially offensively, receiver-wise, because I was used to playing with thoroughbreds. I know what a thoroughbred looks like, right. Musin Muhammad and Steve Smith. Right. We, didn't, we, we, were, we struggled a little bit, receiver-wise. I told Ben on the plane ride down there, I said, you're probably going to have the best game of your life. And he called me old man because, you know, I, I, he goes, why you say that, old man? I said, well, I said, you're the only thing we got. Mm. I said, so you better be ready. I said, because I'm telling you, I'm going to feed you the ball. And I think he had a career high in yards and in catches that day, and we were able to beat him. <laughs> and we got on the plane after. He said, you weren't lying. I said, look, I'm not too smart. I said, but I know – I got to feed the a stud. weapon is a weapon. I yeah. have to feed the stud. And he just, he loved it. He laughed. So we had a great laugh about that. Cleveland uh, doesn't last long. No. Um, and then your final season, Houston. Right. Where essentially you're just filling a gap. Correct. Um, your career's coming to an end. What's that feeling like? I thought I was done after Cleveland. Um, I really and truly did. I was 36, about to be 37. I played 14 years, happy. And um, and I thought I was done. We moved back home, Carrie and I and the girls. They started going to school, uh, enrolled in school here. And uh, I thought I was done. Had some teams contact me in camp. Just kind of said no. Miami Dolphins contacted me in uh, early October. Chad Henney went down. Had a, had a very familiar relationship with the offensive coordinator in Miami at the time who was with me in Cleveland. Mm. Uh, it was enticing. But they're 0-4, lame duck head coach and Tony Sperano. I was like, you know what? I just went through that in Cleveland. I'm not, I'm not doing that. Right. So I said, I th- so I thought that's it. Matt Schaub gets hurt the week before Thanksgiving. Houston contacts me. I have no connections to Houston. 
We're going to Disney World. I'm going to Disney I'm World done. with my wife and kids yeah. that week for Thanksgiving. They'd never been. I'm taking them. Right. It's like, look. Hey, if Matt Liner gets hurt next week, call. But I'm going to Disney World. And Matt Liner broke his collarbone <laughs> the next week, so I'm on, I'm driving in my truck. I'm driving three hours to Houston. I work out for them. I get signed the next day, and I'm backing up a rookie. And so finished out the year there. The last five games of the season. Now the team was winning. Had the team been losing, I would not have signed. Okay. Very simple. Yeah. I mean, that's it was to it was to go to be a part. I I love I love being a part of an organization or a group of men that that want to win and work toward a common goal. And I was so thankful that I went to Houston. Did not know Gary Kubiak at all. Loved playing for him. Some of the I didn't I knew none of the guys, none of the front office. But I enjoyed that so much. And we won the division. Uh, Actually, I played almost the whole game, the last game of the season. We were the three seed. Had, we had nothing to gain. Right. So I knew I was going to play half the game. They needed to give me some reps in that system just in case something happened in the playoffs. Well, sure enough, the young kid separates his shoulder the first play of the game. So I'm playing the whole game, running plays I've never run. Right. And um, we end up losing on the last play of the game. We actually score. We go down and we score. Uh, and before the drive, Kubiak tells me, hey, listen, we're going for two. We're either winning or we're losing. Said so there's no overtime. We don't need it. Right. Andre Johnson was out for a few games because so he's playing. But half the old line they didn't dress. They played the young guys. So I throw a touchdown pass with 16 seconds left, and we're going for two. And we got the right play called. I mean, this is a going to be a walk in. It's just going to be a, just an easy little pass. We jump off sides, so we got to back it up. And sure enough. I go to take the snap in the shotgun, and the poor young kid who's a rookie snaps it over my head. Oh, wow. And so, <laughs> ball game over. So, my last pass was a touchdown in the NFL, and I knew oh, that, that. I knew that yeah. night. Uh, I had a little apartment, uh, and my wife was there and the girls. And uh, I knew that night. I told my wife, I said, this is it. She said, why? I said, my last pass was a touchdown. My first pass was an interception. Mm. You know, I said, this is it. I said, now look, something happens in the playoffs, great. And then uh, we beat Cincinnati, then we lost to uh, Baltimore, and that was it. And I had a few teams contact that spring if I wanted to go be a backup. But I was, I was content and I was happy. The NFL was good to me. Next season rolls around. Were you had any feelings of jumping back in? Or you, you were truly done? Done. That? Truly, truly done. And you've never had any? I, the one-two was there. But the, the, what was on film, I didn't like. I, I didn't like it much in, in Houston either. Uh, yeah, I didn't like it, uh, but no. And actually, we went, that year was 2012. <clears throat> we went to Denver that year right around Thanksgiving. Um, my quarterback coach in Carolina, Mike McCoy, was offensive coordinator in Denver. We went to spend four or five days with him, went to a game. Uh, Peyton was the quarterback for Denver. Mm -hmm. Brandon was still playing. and. Mm -hmm. Our relationship, obviously, Brandon and I goes back from high school, and even Peyton and Brandon and I goes back to early college, working the Manning camp, so we have a deep history. I went, and when I went to practice with the Broncos that day, went to the game on the field before, after the game, hanging out uh, with everybody, and yeah, you miss it, but there was no part of me saying, I want to get back in it. Because that same game, I watched Phillip Rivers struggle, and I watched him run off the field after the game, and I remember telling my wife, that's what I don't miss. Mm. All that time, effort, and energy, and just for not to play well and feel like you let your team down, I don't want that. Side note, if Tom Brady and Peyton Manning just played in different eras, Phillip Rivers would probably— He's pretty good. He's, he's, uh, he's pretty good. It's neither here nor there. Um, he's really good. I think Ben Roethlisberger, I'm a huge Roethlisberger. I just think with a game on the line, and look, he's been playing with the same time as Tom Brady. Yeah, yeah. But I just, Roethlisberger, what he's done throughout the course of his career, I think he's a heck of a player. Phillip Rivers will get him at least one, right? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, can they win in the cold? That's this. Could this be the year? Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, running out of time there, Phillip. Um you come back home. Right. <laughs> You're actually there day to day with a wife and kids. Who took it worse? You being home or them having to deal with you at home? Oh, you know, <laughs> uh I don't I, I didn't I appreciated my time yeah. playing. And I truly believe my oldest, I know she wanted me to continue playing. 
I mean, at that time, she was in the fourth or fifth grade, whatever it was, and uh, she she knew what I did for a living. My youngest, she really still didn't have that much of an idea, but she was she was ready. She she wouldn't ask me; she'd ask my wife. You think Dad will go back to play? And my wife said, "I don't think so." And she said, "Why not?" Mm-hmm. And she said, "Well, but uh, I think she wanted me to go back." Awesome. Well, we're glad to have you back and so happy to see you so involved with the university throughout, even being a part of the recent homecoming video. Why is it so important for you to keep giving back? Look, this place is great to me. I enjoyed every minute I spent here. Uh, this place is great, and this was this is home. Yeah. You know, and uh, look, football gave me an opportunity to meet a lot of people, um, do a lot of things that I probably wouldn't have been able to do. Uh, people were great to me, and I just try to – Try to be great to them, help out when when and where I can, and if that can bring any excitement, interest, whatever it may be, you know, I think that's, I don't know, I just think that's a duty. Let's end on this. Some quick takes. All right. Don't even think, just answer. Mushin Muhammad or Steve Smith? Oh, God. Man, that's hard. I look, I'd have to say Steve, but I'll tell you what, that's a one in one A. Uh, yeah. Mushin Muhammad doesn't get the, he, yeah, he was... He was good. Just give me the last name. Who's the greatest quarterback of all time? Brady. That hurt you? Mm-mm. Would you trade your favorite horse for a 2003 Super Bowl win? One million percent yes. Ladies and gentlemen, the legend. <laughs> Jake DeLone, thank you for the time, brother. Absolutely. I enjoyed it. All right.